Reza Mashari, Marashi, sorry about that, is the only guest speaker we have hosted three times in a little over a year. He has a following here at our council for his articulate, knowledgeable, and balanced analysis on the critical issues facing the Arab Middle East. He is here this evening to talk about the unintended consequences of the Arab Spring. We are fortunate to have Riza with us tonight. He is flying out tomorrow to observe the Iranian nuclear talks in Vienna that are resuming this week. Reza, it is my pleasure to welcome you back to Western Michigan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's good to be back in, in, in Western Michigan. I, uh, I like coming out here. Everybody's very friendly. Um, Washington, D.C. is not a very friendly place, contrary to what you may have heard. So I, I think it's good to come out and do these kinds of things in places like Grand Rapids or, or Sacramento or, or maybe somewhere in between like Chicago because I live in a bubble called Washington, D.C. And when you live in a bubble and you have conversations with people who are in your bubble, it can get a bit redundant. Uh, but more importantly, sometimes when you have conversations with people in the bubble exclusively, you get detached from the kind of conversations you really should be having, which is the kind of conversation I hope to have tonight. It's my job as an analyst in the nation's capital to present my analysis, my thoughts, my views in a way that is digestible for you, not for a way that's digestible for people inside Washington, D.C., who ostensibly are supposed to be thinking about and doing more or less the exact same thing that I'm doing. So, so it's good to be here, and it's, it's humbling to be here, not only because it is my third time here, but it's also humbling to be here because I'm supposed to talk about something that's still happening. Um, this thing we call the Arab Spring, it's not done, it's not over, it's still ongoing. And um, I'm, I'm hoping to have a conversation tonight that uh, admittedly not everybody in Washington or even outside of Washington is going to agree with some of the things that I say, precisely because it's still ongoing. But I hope the conversation that we have uh, in my remarks can spur an active and interesting Q&A session. And you know, I would be remiss to, not, to you know, not start out my remarks by saying in you know, 30 to 35 minutes, there's absolutely no way to cover everything on this issue. I'm hoping my remarks can serve as that springboard, though, and if there's, not, if there's something that you would like to discuss that I don't get to in what I've decided to present today, feel free to ask the question. I'm happy to go over it. You know, as the old saying goes, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, when I was asked to present on this issue, um, I had to sit and think for a minute about what I wanted to talk about. Um, I don't want to come to a World Affairs Council and have a conversation uh, about a set of topics or issues that you could go and uh, read the headlines and get an understanding of. I want to have a conversation about things that need to be discussed that aren't getting the attention that I think that they deserve in order to solve problems in the world. So the set of topics that I've picked out has been intentional, and, and I hope that it can be a little bit more thought-provoking than uh, what we're seeing in the headlines and, uh, and what we're hearing from others. Precisely because the Arab Spring is still happening, I think we need to delve into the issue of what makes a revolutionary type situation, what factors go into it. And, and when I say that, I'm talking about a common thread that can be seen in all of the countries where upheaval has been taking place over the past couple of years, from Syria to Egypt, from Bahrain to Libya, and everywhere in between. Because even though each situation in these respective countries is different, there is similarities. And if we understand what the similarities are, in my view, that helps us get a better understanding of what the overarching broad-based themes are, so then we can focus on the details that are specific to each particular place. So what I've done is I've assessed that there are eight factors that go into making a revolutionary type situation. And these eight factors can be broken into four that pertain to the governments or regimes that have been part of the Arab Spring, and four that pertain to the opposition movements or the pro-revolutionary type movements that we've been seeing in the Middle East. So I'll, un I'll unpack them for you. 
we can have a little bit of a discussion about how they apply to certain cases, certain countries in this part of the world. And then we want to talk about the United States and how does the United States fit into all of this. So we have a lot to discuss. So let's dive right in. What are some of these factors that play in to how governments or regimes in this part of the world see the Arab Spring? Well, first we have to look at ideological legitimacy. If a revolutionary type movement is going to be taking place in a country, does the government have ideological legitimacy? If people aren't buying what a government is selling, that's a pretty destabilizing factor, but that alone isn't enough to cause a revolutionary situation. There's also the question of efficient management. How is the government managing the political and economic affairs of the state? And are people happy with that management? That goes a long way towards the inclination of people in a given country to rise up or be satisfied and focus their attention on the average day-to-day -day of taking care of their family and loved ones. The third factor is unity and cohesion amongst the political elite. The more united the political elite in a respective country is, the harder it is to shake up the system because they're all working towards the same goal. If the political elites in a country are divided, that creates opportunities for opposition movements to exploit those divisions and push for change in a way that's much more difficult to do when everybody's playing on the same team or on the same side. And the fourth factor, in my view, that plays in to how governments or regimes view or, uh, or operationalize revolutionary type movements is their coercive capacity, their monopoly on violence. What's the army doing? What's the police doing? What is the security state and the security services doing? Are they united? Are they still following the marching orders of the political elite? Or, or have they declared uh, neutrality? Or are they backing the protesters? Where do they fall into this equation? So those are the four factors that governments need to consider and that they need to manage in order for revolutionary type situations to be successful or not successful. Now, that's the governments. We also need to look at what the opposition or revolutionary type movements are factoring in. Obviously, the first component that's important for a revolutionary type movement is mass discontent. If there's not mass discontent, then there's not going to be a groundswell of people that are pushing against the status quo. So, and, and we've seen that mass discontent, right? But it's not just mass discontent that can get an opposition movement or a revolutionary type situation to where it's trying to go. There also needs to be organization. Because if you have mass discontent and it's unorganized, then it's going in a bunch of different directions. You're not channeling it towards a common goal. But there has to be some kind of organization so that it's channeled towards something specific. Yeah? You have to know not only what you're against, but what you're for. In addition to organization, there needs to be leadership. At some point in time, over the course of uh, a revolutionary type situation, there has to be some kind of charismatic leader or some kind of charismatic leadership that can channel that mass discontent, give it the guidance and moral support that it needs, and help shape its goals in a way that's not only digestible, but realistic and achievable. And the fourth thing that I would say is ideology. There has to be some sort of ideology that people are rallying around. There can't just be mass discontent organization and leadership. There has to be an idea. Like I said before, you have to know not just what you're against, but what you're for. So wh why am I unpacking all of this for you? Because I think that these are factors that if you look at the various situations that have been taking place in the Arab world over the past few years, we can see why certain things, why certain movements have succeeded and why certain movements have failed. And we can also get a better idea of what success and failure looks like. So let's use a few examples. I like to break them up into Syria on one hand and, uh, and Bahrain and Egypt and Libya. 
we don't have to only limit it to these four countries, but for the sake of time and for the sake of sanity, I'm limiting it to these four countries. There are other countries in the Middle East, and I understand that. And during the Q&A, if you'd like to go over how this applies to any specific country, I'm happy to do that as best I can. But I do think that it's important to point out that if we get an understanding of what, how these factors fit into these various countries, it can explain where we are today and potentially where we might be going forward. And then, of course, it's easier to factor in where the United States fits into all of this once we get a better understanding. So let's, let's go over the list. Let's go over the list of, of the four factors on the regime side, the four factors on the opposition side, and see how they fit in. Ideological legitimacy. Well, clearly there wouldn't be mass discontent if the ideological legitimacy in these four countries that I've named was you know, rock solid, if there was a solid footing. So the ideological legitimacy is shaky in all four of these governments. Has there been efficient management of the political and economic and social affairs in these countries? Well, no, because people are protesting. People are complaining, and, and they're complaining precisely because of that. The management of the state by these governments has been subpar, and people are tired of it. So you can check that box. The third box, is there unity amongst the political elite? Is there cohesion? Well, this is where it gets tricky. In Syria, one could argue that the government has maintained a certain level of unity or cohesion, not because it's popular, but because it's a government that's run by a minority faction. And they stick together largely because they perceive their survival to be based on sticking together. Juxtapose that with Egypt. At first, the political elites, they were not unified. This is one of the biggest reasons why Hosni Mubarak was overthrown. The Muslim Brotherhood won an election, and then subsequently, for a host of reasons, which we can get into later, was overthrown, quite violently, might I add, overthrown. Now, whether or not you think that's a good thing, I'm using this as an example to demonstrate that the elites were not unified, but then they were able to reunify largely, not completely. They didn't put Humpty Dumpty back together, but they unified in a way that they hadn't for at least a year, if not two, precisely because they figured out what they were against, which was the brotherhood. It becomes much more difficult for them to govern the state now because now they have to talk about what they're for. If the brotherhood is imprisoned and pushed to the sideline of politics, okay, well now what? What about the day after? So this question of elite unity and cohesion in Egypt, I think, remains unanswered. We don't know how it's going to play out in the long run. What about Libya? I think you could say a very similar situation where the elites fragmented. People started to peel away from the center of the Gaddafi regime. And as a result of that, that created the opportunity to exploit those divisions. And then when Western countries decided to give it the final push, the rest is history. And then what about Bahrain? Well, Bahrain, we see a somewhat similar situation to what we're seeing in Syria with regards to the idea of cohesion amongst the political elites. Bahrain is run by a minority faction, their government, the ruling elite, or the royal family. And they very violently have suppressed the opposition, which happened to be the majority in the country. So the elites have been unified, but they've been unified because they fear that their survival is dependent on it. There has not been a process of reconciliation, of, of, of attempting to acknowledge the past, focus on the future, and figure out a way to work together. And we're going to come back to that point in a little bit. And then naturally, the monopoly on violence, the coercive capacity, has manifested itself in different ways in these countries as well. In Syria, the government has not lost a monopoly on violence. And this is one of the biggest reasons why foreign countries, whether it's the United States, Saudi Arabia, or any country in between is trying to pump support into the opposition to level the playing field because the government maintains that monopoly on violence. Same story in Bahrain. The government maintains a monopoly on violence and they've been supported by Saudi Arabia and others in an effort to put down the protests. Obviously in Libya, it's a very different story. The government was not able to maintain 
a monopoly on violence. Its coercive capacity eroded, and that opened up the opportunity for armed opposition with the help of Western countries to push against the regime and inevitably overthrow it. And then in Egypt, one of the biggest reasons why Mubarak fell was because his monopoly on violence came to an end. The military said, we are not going to back you anymore. Once that was done, his fate was sealed. But then they reasserted their monopoly on violence in an effort to get rid of the monopoly and reinsert themselves back at the forefront of Egyptian politics. So it's shifted in Egypt. Now, these are the factors that play into just the regime side. We also have to look at what's happened in the opposition side in each of these four countries to see how they've manifested themselves. Mass discontent obviously has existed in all four of these countries. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about an Arab Spring. So that much we know is clear. But what about the leadership factor? Has there been leadership within the oppositions in these four countries? Well, again, the record is spotty. In Egypt, there was an organized opposition. In fact, for years, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt was arguably the most organized opposition. And there's a lot of different reasons for that that we can get into if you like. This is not me praising the Muslim Brotherhood. It's saying they were organized and they created a way to be organized even though they were uh, in opposition for many, many years. So sure, you had, the, you had the Brotherhood that was organized and they were able to organize and win the elections that took place in Egypt before the military reasserted itself. The opposition in Bahrain, I would argue, was beginning to get more organized and coalesce before the monopoly on violence was utilized by the government. One of the biggest reasons why governments use violence is precisely to prevent oppositions from being able to develop organization. The more organized you are, the more effective you become, the harder it is for the governments to put the toothpaste back in the tube. Then you're talking about this question of leadership. Do these opposition movements have leadership? In Egypt, they did, until the military reasserted itself. In Syria, not so much. This is one of the biggest problems that Western governments continue to harp on, even in their public statements, that it's tough to unify the opposition, it's tough to find leadership that we can sub feel comfortable supporting to the tilt. In Bahrain, there was leadership, emerging until the government's monopoly on violence reasserted itself and tried to cut the head off the snake, as they like to say. And in Libya, Western governments felt that there was enough leadership to back the process of overthrowing an authoritarian government with a dictator at its head. But I would argue that perhaps there wasn't as much thinking that went into the day after. And this is a set, I think, into where does this all fit in as it pertains to the United States. Because oftentimes, you'll hear the United States get blamed for everything under the sun, and I don't think that's fair. We can assume responsibility for our missteps, but we should also right-size the expectations of those of us that are here and those of us that are abroad in understanding what kind of role we actually play versus the role that some think we play, but maybe it's perhaps not the best interpretation of what it is we really do. So has U.S. policy adapted successfully? Well, I think the answer has to be yes and no. How can you render a final judgment on something that's still ongoing? So that's frustrating in one sense, because we have to say, well, we've done this good, maybe we haven't done that good, but it also gives us the opportunity to assess and have a conversation about what we can do better. We have the luxury of self-correcting here. We don't have to worry about if we try to have an open conversation about what our strengths and weaknesses are, a government's gonna be breathing down our neck, throwing us in jail, beating us, imprisoning us, which happens in a lot of these Middle Eastern countries, and we should be honest about that. Having this conversation, perhaps most importantly, can help us avoid repeating mistakes. You make a mistake once, that's that's an honest mistake. If you make a mistake twice, three times, well then, that's Washington, D.C. No, but <laughs> in, in all seriousness, that's when it becomes uh, self-defeating and perhaps a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I would start off by saying, in some ways, we've been successful. 
the United States government has come out in some of these occasions and openly supported the protesters and openly supported the push for change, both rhetorically and through concrete action. The problem is that in other places, we've not done that. It's, there's been an uneven application of supporting protest movements across the Middle East, and we need to have an honest conversation about why that is the case. I personally believe that above all else, the reason why is because we have interests and we have values. The goal for any country, but especially the United States because we are the superpower, is to actively seek out and achieve your interests while promoting your values abroad. Everybody wants to have their cake and eat it too. That's human nature. But in the real world, you're oftentimes forced to choose. And if you can't have both, which one are you going to choose? And I'm here to tell you that when we are forced to choose, almost always without fail, we pursue our interests at the expense of our values. Now, I think the reason why there is a problem with that is because, A, it hasn't been working, and B, it's not sustainable. And if we know something's not been working, and if we know it's not sustainable, because there is flux in this part of the world, we need to ask ourselves, what are our options at recalibrating so that we can move forward and American policy can be successful? So what are our interests in this part of the world? For decades, they've been defined as political stability and secure access to energy resources, not just for us, but we ensure the secure access of energy resources to the rest of the world as well. So even if the United States becomes increasingly inter energy in independent as we are, we're still going to have an interest in the Middle East because other countries are getting their energy resources increasingly from that part of the world. And if we're policing it, then that gives us leverage vis-a-vis -vis these other countries. So it's, it's in our interest to continue to, to do this as the United States has dictated it for decades now. Stability and secure access to energy resources are the two primary interests that we have in this part of the world. Our values, self-explanatory, democracy, human rights, civil society, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, all the things we hold true here in our own country are the exact same values that ostensibly we should be promoting around the world. And we have a good track record of promoting these kinds of things around the world. Think about Europe after World War II. Think about uh, the former Soviet Union states after the fall of the Soviet Union, especially in places like Central Asia and things like that. When I say this, I'm not saying that our efforts to balance these two, our interests and our values, has been perfect. I'm saying in some places we've done it better than others. And our track record, largely, I think, is better than most other countries. There's always going to be room for improvement. Now. The reason why I don't think this is sustainable anymore is because the bargain that we struck with a lot of governments in this part of the world was, we're going to set up the rules of the game. We are the guarantor and the architect of regional security in the Middle East. So the governments in this part of the world, if you play by the rules of the game that we set up, we will support you. And perhaps, unfortunately, at times, we will turn a blind eye to the way that you treat your own people. The flip side of this, of course, is that if you have Saddam Hussein's Iraq, or Assad's Syria, or the Islamic Republic of Iran, countries like this that are not willing to play by the rules of the game that the United States sets up, well, then we're quite critical of your human rights record. Then we're quite critical of the way you treat your own people. Then we're quite critical of your government systems, as we should be. But when the double standard exists, when we're emphasizing certain things in one country, criticizing Iran's human rights record and the way it treats its own people, but we don't do it in Saudi Arabia, where it's just as bad, if not worse, neither are good, we have to ask ourselves why. And asking ourselves why, we have to ask ourselves, is that sustainable when millions of people throughout this part of the world are protesting? What are they protesting for? the political, economic, and social aspirations that they have long had, that have long been unmet. They are not being unmet because of America. Their own governments have to assume the responsibility for the actions that they've taken, and they're slowly starting to, re and I emphasize slowly, starting to realize this. 
But we have to ask ourselves how we factor into that equation. And if we have been providing support, both politically, economically, and other kinds of military aid and, and, and other forms of uh, material support to the various governments in this part of the world, one would think we've built up a certain kind of leverage. And if we're going to talk about the leverage that we have with our allies and partners in this, in this part of the world, we also have to talk about the kind of regional flux that's taking place. This provides a golden opportunity for the United States to go to our friends and say, your people are unhappy. And they're, you can say that they're unhappy because of us, but that's just an excuse. We could even go as far as to say, sure, we'll accept our fair share of the blame. But if, um, let's say, hypothetically speaking, America accepts a share of the blame, that doesn't solve your problems. That doesn't solve the fact that your populations are predominantly 35 and younger and vastly underemployed, highly educated, and very frustrated with the lack of opportunities that are being provided. The fear, of course, through the by the majority of these governments is if they reform and if they recalibrate, that opens up the opportunity for opposition to get organized, for leadership in an opposition to develop, for an ideology to emerge, and then that lessens and threatens their grip on power. It's not rocket science. Governments want to stay in power. It doesn't matter if it's a democracy or, or, or a dictatorship. The goal is to stay in power. You know, we see a lot of this in our own Congress. Obviously, it manifests itself in different ways, but that's the goal. You hear a lot about, you know, is, is what's going on in this part of the world, is it, is it about the compatibility of, of Islam and democracy? I don't think that's the right conversation. I'm not saying it's not important, but I'm saying that if we have a conversation about whether or not Islam and democracy are compatible, I think that's a two-minute conversation. And the reason why I think it's a two-minute conversation is because Islam and democracy are as compatible as the people who are practicing the religion. I would say the same thing about Judaism. I would say the same thing about Christianity. And I would say the same thing about any other religion and its ability to coexist with democracy. People make decisions. People interpret religion. So if there is upheaval in this part of the world, people know what they're against. They're trying to figure out what they're for. The democratic culture that we have here in our country took quite a bit of time to develop. We fought a war over these kinds of things less than 200 years ago. So the expectation that Middle Eastern countries could go from dictatorships to democracy and perfect it overnight, I think is unrealistic. So understanding that, the reason why I'm saying all of this is because I think the United States needs to play the long game. I think the United States should be honest with itself. I think the United States should say, there are things that we can do. For example, let's take one-third of the money that we spend on arms deals in this part of the world, which is in the billions. One-third of that money, and let's spend it on education. Let's spend it on health. Let's spend it on uh, picking up trash. Let's spend it on building roads. Let's spend it on creating infrastructure in these countries. Sure, the risk is there that it could get destroyed or it could get blown up. We see this in Iraq. We see this in Afghanistan. But the message that it sends is a powerful one to the people in these countries. And if we're not doing it, by the way, somebody else is. You hear about organizations, paramilitary organizations like Hamas, for example, or Hezbollah. We hear a lot about their ideology, and we should have that conversation about what they stand for and what they're against. But the reason why they're able to make headway with people in their respective countries isn't only predicated on Islam or whatever their interpretation of Islam is. They're going out and they're building these roads. They're going out and they're picking up the trash. They're feeding kids. They're creating schools. They're doing things intentionally that the governments aren't doing in an effort to undermine them. And then through doing those kinds of things, groups like Hezbollah and Hamas are creating buy-in to their ideology. There's no reason why the United States and our allies in this part of the world can't do the same thing to create buy-in to what we are trying to build. It's going to take a recalibration. And I'm not naive in saying all of this, by the way. I know that the likelihood of it happening 
so far is low. But I would say that anybody that disagrees with what I'm proposing tonight has so far, at least in Washington, maybe you guys are smarter than the people, and frankly, you are probably smarter than a lot of the people in Washington, maybe you guys have recommendations that Washington either isn't listening to or isn't coming up with. Because if you know something's not working, you've got to try something else. And it has to be a longer-term process. It has to be a longer-term investment. We need to be willing to lose small in order to win big in this part of the world. We know what the model looks like. We have international development agencies, USAID. We have diplomats in this part of the world that are active and understand the political, economic, and social dynamics in this part of the world. So I'm confident that if we make this investment and if we shift the paradigm and we shift our goals, there's no reason why American preeminence can't carry forward into the future. What I can guarantee you, and in politics you can't guarantee much, what I can guarantee you is the status quo is not sustainable. And you don't need to take my word for it. Millions of people protesting in this part of the world is a clear demonstration of that. And when there is a vacuum, a power vacuum, a leadership vacuum, an economic vacuum, somebody is going to fill it. The question is who? And the question is with what? I think that we, more than anybody else in the world, have the ability to fill it with all of the things that we know to be good and successful, the things that we fill it with here in our own country. It's not going to be as easy, but I think it's the kind of investment that we need to start making in order to win the future. So let me stop there. L l let's dive into Q&A, and I hope that we can start to unpack what, I, what I'm sure are, are questions that are specific to different countries and, and all other kinds of things. So thank you for taking the time to listen. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so technical difficulty problem. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read a question um, from text, but I encourage everyone to text, text questions to um, the phone number given so we can get through a lot of questions if possible. Um, can you expand on the issue of diplomacy? I don't know. I came in a little late, and I want to make sure that I'm not duplicating, but can you um, expand on the issue of diplomacy, and what instruments can we use to get our way and to persuade countries to act in ways that perhaps are in their best interest, but especially in our best interest? Sure. You know, there are a finite number of ways to solve problems in the world. Um, you have diplomacy and you have military conflict. The dirty little secret that most people don't like to tell you is that war does not solve problems. War, at the end of the day, is something that you do to build leverage because every war ends at the negotiating table. So really, the only way to solve problems is through a negotiation. It's through a durable political solution where people don't get everything that they want, but they make enough compromise so that they get more than they would get if they remain in the conflict that they are previously entrenched in. So if we understand that diplomacy provides the most viable and successful route for ending conflict, and providing a better future, we need to ask ourselves what the different kinds of diplomacy are. I'm of the opinion that there are three different kinds of diplomacy. And I admit that if you talk to different people, you might get a different answer to this question. But hear me out, and let me know what you think. First kind of diplomacy, backroom diplomacy. I'm of the view that this is the most effective kind. Diplomacy is not supposed to take place in front of journalists and media cameras and on TV. It's supposed to happen in back rooms where nobody but the diplomats are and they get food brought to them and they sit down and they hash it out over an extended period of time, not hours, days, and weeks. I'm talking months, sometimes years, because diplomacy is not talking about talking to your friends. It's about talking to your enemies and trying to solve conflicts with the people that you don't get along with. 
and that's best done away from the limelight so that you can have the conversations about very tough and difficult issues that in most cases are long overdue. But sometimes those conversations that you have, the backroom diplomacy away from the limelight, don't always produce the results that we would hope that they produce. So when they don't, what do we do? We go to the megaphones. We do megaphone diplomacy. That's when we bring the cameras in. That's when we bring journalists in, and we try to shape the narrative of whatever issue it is that's under, uh, under discussion in a way that's more favorable towards us so that people in the general public are buying whatever it is that we're selling. Let me give you an example of what this might look like. Uh, starting uh, today, or tomorrow, depending on who you talk to, Iran and the permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany are going to start the latest round of their negotiations over Iran's nuclear program. Two days ago, Iran went to the megaphones and said that one of their nuclear facilities, uh, there were attempts at sabotaging it. And this was a facility that previously was not being uh, inspected by the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is the international agency that monitors different countries' nuclear programs. But the interim nuclear deal that was signed by Iran and Western powers in November granted access to this previously uninspected facility. So the Iranians went to the megaphones and complained about this. Why did they do it? Well, you notice they went to the media and they complained about it. They didn't storm away from the negotiating table. So they're trying to build leverage by saying, we're living up to our end of the bargain. It's these other countries that aren't. And they're taking advantage of the deal that we signed to try to exploit us and try to make them look like the victim in the debate in the court of public opinion. And then just yesterday, the United States came out and said, Iran is still attempting to acquire illicit materials that could be connected to its nuclear program, while negotiations are ongoing. And you'll notice we didn't end the negotiations. We didn't throw our hands in the air and say, oh, we can't talk to these people. We went to journalists and did exactly what the Iranians did 24 hours before. Why? In an effort to create leverage and say, no, 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 it's the Iranians that aren't living up to their end of the bargain. So sometimes, even when negotiations are ongoing, even if they're working and producing results, you go to the megaphones in an effort to try and create leverage before the negotiations begin. But usually, people go to the megaphones when the diplomacy is not producing the results that it would hope. Going to, the goal of going to the megaphones is to sharpen choices and make sure that people understand that it's actually in their interest to continue the diplomatic process and make compromises. It's to bring people back to the table if they leave it, or to make sure that they stay at the table in good faith. The third kind of diplomacy is coercive diplomacy. Coercive diplomacy is very difficult to pull off because you're punishing a country while you're negotiating with it. And again, Iran is a good example. It's not the only example, but it's a good example because we have sanctions that are on. We've not, we're not putting any new sanctions on Iran as we negotiate but the sanctions that we've already put in place, we're keeping. And we're not providing a very significant amount of sanctions relief in the interim deal. So while we are sanctioning them and, and, and hurting their economy, we're negotiating with them. And, and, and how does that, it's a very delicate balancing act. You know, usually, it's very tough for a train to run on two tracks. So on one track, you have diplomacy, and on the other track, you have pressure and, and, and things like that. It's, it's very difficult to maintain that balancing act in a successful way. And the track record of it is not overwhelmingly successful. So far, in the case of Iran and the United States, we've been able to pull it off. But the reason why I think we've been able to pull it off is because the Iranians have leverage. They have different kinds of leverage on us as well. So if our leverage is sanctions and the other form of pressure that we've been ramping up over the past two to three years, and that's either brought the Iranians to the table or kept them at the table, one could just as easily argue that the Iranians have systematically increased the technical aspects of their nuclear program in such a way that it's brought us to the table or kept us at the table. So there's a propensity to focus on what we've done to the other country and a propensity to downplay what that other country has done to us. And the Iranians do the exact same thing, by the way. So these are the three kinds of diplomacy. 
Um, again, I emphasize, I think that you have to try the backroom diplomacy first. It has the greatest uh, rate of success. And, and frankly, th that's what diplomats do. That's why we have embassies abroad. That's why we have a State Department. Um, if all it was were government officials going around the world and you know, uh, gallivanting in front of cameras, there would be no need for diplomats who do very real and difficult work trying to hammer out these kinds of agreements around the world. So I hope that answers the question. The um, dynamics in Syria, I asked earlier, have changed drastically in the last week vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. Before, we had a little bit of leverage with Syria. We had Russia on our side as far as chemical weapons and the destruction of chemical weapons. Syria is now well behind in that time schedule. We no longer, or possibly no longer, have Russian uh, backing with us on that. And we also, so I'm wondering if you could comment on how Syria has now changed since in the last week vis-a-vis -vis the Russians and the U.S. Yeah. relationship. It's a good question. I think contrary to popular belief, Russia's actually played a fairly positive role uh, on Iran and on Syria in terms of our interactions with them. That is not a that's not me praising the Russian position on either of these issues. We have very serious disagreements with the Russians on Iran. We have very serious disagreements with the Russians on Syria. But their foreign minister has been working very diligently to try and square the circle and try to come up with a win-win solution on both of these issues. And, and, and it's tough. It's not easy to do. Sometimes diplomacy is not successful. But over the past week, because of events in Ukraine, uh, that has certainly heightened the costs involved for everybody. And very real and very legitimate questions are being asked about how does our disagreement with Russia over what's happening in Ukraine carry over, or does it carry over, into negotiations with Iran and into the Syria issue? Uh, I think the jury is still out, quite frankly. Because on the one hand, it's in Russia's interest to make sure that the Assad regime fo not only follows through on its agreements pertaining to the chemical weapons, even though it is happening at a slower pace than it should be, but it's also in their interest to make sure that the civil war does not bleed over and explode in ways that it currently uh, is not. And, and that's saying a lot, because the situation in Syria is an absolute disaster, especially in terms of how it's impacting innocent people. But the longer it goes on, the more it saps Russia of influence and resources. It's very difficult for Russia to go to other countries around the world and say, hey, you should do business with us and you should trust us because look at what we're doing in Syria. It's not a good sell. The Iranians have the exact same problem, by the way. And by most accounts, the Russians have actually played a very calming influence in negotiations on uh, the Iranian nuclear issue. The Russian foreign minister has been very helpful in trying to bridge gaps. This is according to some of the negotiators I've spoken with. It's not my personal opinion. Could that change as a result of the Ukraine on the Iran issue? Or excuse me, could, could uh, the Iran issue be impacted by what's happening in Ukraine? It could, but Russia does not want to see Iran that develops a nuclear weapon. Russia also wants to avoid a war with Iran. It doesn't want that to take place because it borders Iran, and you don't want U.S. military on your border. This is actually one of the biggest reasons why Russia is none too pleased with what our policy on Ukraine is. So we have some very real problems. And there was a, there was a photo that came out the other day of uh, Secretary of State John Kerry and the Russian foreign minister walking through a big grassy field. Sometimes that's really the essence of diplomacy. I think that picture captures it. Here you have two men who pretty much disagree with each other on just about everything as it pertains to the Ukraine. And I guarantee you that at least part of that conversation was, how do we prevent this from bleeding over into other issues that we're actually making progress on? Because it's in their interest to ensure that progress on these other issues continues. Will the Russians try to use it as leverage? Of course. But Russia has a track record of selling to the highest bidder and extracting as much as they can from a particular issue, and then selling high. So 
it remains to be seen the degree to which this blows up. It's still very combustible. But I would like to think that whether you're Vladimir Putin or Barack Obama, and irrespective of what your views are, your bottom line is, what is our goal? What is our goal? And even if that question is answered differently in Washington and Moscow, there's actually a lot of overlap in terms of goals as it pertains to Syria and Iran. Not 100% overlap, but enough, hopefully, where cooler heads can prevail. I hope that answers the question about something that's still very much ongoing. <laughs> we have a lot of text sure. questions, but there's uh, two questions on Tunisia. The first one, and I'll, I'll give them both to you so you can address them at the same time. John Kerry recently praised Tunisia on their progress. Can you highlight some of the things they've achieved? And then um, the other one was, can you give, an, give us an example of an unanticipated consequence from, say, Tunisia, a positive perspective, and then perhaps a consequence the U.S. did not foresee? Sure. Again, this is one of those things where you ask 10 different people, they're going to tell you 10 different things. So I'm going to give you my personal opinion. I think that uh, if you compare Tunisia to the upheaval that's happened in many of the other countries in this part of the world, Tunisia's been able to largely avoid the kind of violence that we've been seeing elsewhere. I'm not saying that violence hasn't occurred in Tunisia. I'm saying that if you compare, say, for example, Syria and Tunisia, the Tunisians are in a much better place, and we should be thankful for that. It could have been much worse. Uh, so I, I look at it through that prism. And, you know, we had a lunch today. We were at a university. We had a lunch today, and, and, and there, was a, uh, there was a Tunisian there. And I asked her what she thought, and I think she said something in a far more articulate way than I had thought about it previously. Because I made this point about needing an opposition movement, needing an ideology, needing leadership, you know, um, and uh, needing organization. And she said, well, there wasn't any real leadership at the beginning. You know, there was mass discontent, and that was able to achieve the objective of getting rid of the dictator. And I said to her, that's true, you're right. But what's happened since then? What have been the political machinations since then? Has leadership and organization emerged? And her answer was more or less yes and no. There's still a lot of back and forth. There's still a lot of fighting. There's still a lot of bickering. But last time I checked, there's a whole lot of that going on in Washington as well. So maybe that's not such a bad thing because it's still in its infant stages, because these different groups and individuals are still in the process of learning about one another through personal interaction instead of rumor, because the process of learning to work together and compromise is still new and fresh, I think our expectations should be right-sized. There's a lot of people that would come up and stand before you today and, 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 you know, and give very rosy assessments. I'm much more cautious and I'm much more focused on how do we ensure that what's happening six inches in front of our face can be carried out to the 12 inches and beyond. You know, we need to protect what's happening now while maintaining a longer-term vision, in my view. And Tunisia is a very, very good example of that. And I think the world will be much better off in the future if we can get a lot of these other countries in this part of the world, especially countries like Syria, where the death and destruction is rampant, to a place where Tunisia is. So while Tunisia is far from perfect, and there's still a long ways to go, I think we also have to ask ourselves, could it be worse? Yes. Is there still a long ways to go? No question. But the process is moving uh, in a direction that I think that's more positive than negative, and that's what makes somebody like Secretary Kerry comfortable to go to the podium and, and praise some of the good things that we're seeing and then rest assured, somebody like Secretary Kerry, when the cameras are off and the journalists go home, are going to have some very real and uncomfortable conversations with politicians in Tunisia, criticizing them for what the United States believes are shortcomings. I hope that answers the question. What role does the Palestinian-Israel conflict have in the regional stability, and does the US risk another intifada should we engage in the peace process and see it fail? Wow, well, let's talk about the easy stuff now. <laughs> um, 
Look, at the end of the day, General David Petraeus said something that stood out to me while he was still serving in government. And he upset a lot of people when he said it, not just in Washington, but in Tel Aviv. He said that one of the biggest root causes of anti-Americanism and terrorism in the world is the perpetuation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the inability to solve it. That takes a lot of guts to say, a lot. And it takes, not a lot of people could say it, it takes somebody like David Petraeus to say that. You know, you're not going to see a president of the United States come out and say it the same way that Petraeus said it. Because for somebody like Petraeus, there's not going to be a cost involved. You know, before the whole, and he said this before, obviously, the whole controversy came up, but, you know, his record was sterling at the time that he said it. That's why he could say it. And he didn't have to worry about getting reelected. That's why he could say it. How does this factor in? Well, well you know, I think, I think General Petraeus is right. You know, the inability to solve this causes problems. And, you know, if we're going to talk about interests versus values, one could argue that it is not only in the interest of the United States, but it, our values would be achieved by promoting a durable solution that is just for both sides. Because if you look at what we're doing, we provide a lot of support to the Israeli, military, financial, um, development aid, et cetera, et cetera. We provide a lot of aid. We provide a, provide a lot of support to the Israelis in other kinds of ways, uh, especially uh, in uh, multilateral institutions like the United Nations. We provide a certain level of political protection for them. Um, but the flip side to that, of course, is that friends don't let friends drive drunk. If you know something is not working and it's causing problems, what are you doing to address it and fix it? And, 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 and here's where the problem lies, because we're not making progress on the other side of this, <laughs> this area of, of, of land, if you will. So we are helping in a lot of ways for Israel as a country to develop. You know, the, the military aid that we provide to the Israelis is billions of dollars that they themselves don't have to spend, that they can spend on economic development and other kinds of development in Israel. That helps democracy develop there, that helps the economy develop there, and that helps society develop there. The problem is that those three things are not developing for everybody. They're not developing for everybody. I'm a big believer that there is a way to make it so that these three things, the political, economic, and social aspirations, can develop for not just Israelis, but also Palestinians. So I commend President Obama and Secretary Kerry for taking this on. Um, it's a thankless task. But at the end of the day, I think it's something that we actually need to try. Do you run the risk of another intifada breaking out if you fail? I don't think that's the right way of looking at it. I think you have to ask yourself what risk you run if you don't try. Because we know what the status quo is. If the status quo was sustainable, then Israel would not continue to place the emphasis that it does on security. Now, what I just said there isn't that the Israelis are unreasonable to be worried about security. It is to say that if Israel perceives there to be threats from uh, Palestinians or Palestinian groups, then how do you solve it? And the way I'm also arguing that some of the ways that they've adopted so far have not eliminated what they perceive to be a problem. So then we have to ask ourselves, what hasn't been tried? And frankly, at this point in time, 60, 70 years later, the only thing that hasn't been tried is a durable diplomatic solution to this problem. So I, I think there's a much larger risk involved in, in not trying and in not solving it than there is in trying and failing. Because if you try and you fail, then what's already going on gets worse. If you don't try, then what's already going on gets worse. <laughs> so the, what really, what, what, what's really happening here is a president of the United States has decided to use some of his political capital in an effort to solve a long-standing problem. 
And you know what? Every president, Republican or Democrat, has a finite amount of political capital at his disposal or her disposal, hopefully sometime in the future. We should have a woman president at some point in time. But irrespective of who that is, man, woman, Republican or Democrat, the political capital that you have, not only is it finite, but you have to use it, that finite amount, on foreign policy and domestic policy. So let's, say, let's quantify political capital. Let's say that political capital is $20 bill. Work with me here. It's a $20 bill. How much of that $20 do you really think you're going to spend on foreign policy? Probably not more than five bucks. Probably because all politics is local. So if that $5 that you're spending on foreign policy issues, you're taking some pretty big risks. Israel, Palestine, Iran, Syria, and that's just in this part of the world. Never mind Asia, Latin America, and Europe. The situation with Ukraine coming up now. I mean, how do you, how do you juggle all of this? Can you juggle all of this? That's why I give John Kerry and President Obama credit. Because they're not just throwing their hands in the air and saying, man, we got a lot of problems. Oh, well, <laughs> 2016 will come and we won't have to deal with it anymore. They're actually giving it a go. Um, and that's better than the alternative, uh, which is allowing conflict conflict, excuse me, to sustain itself and explode in your face and get worse. Um, the balance of power in, in region is concerning in the Mideast. Can we expect the EU to take more leadership due to their interests and values? Mm, it's a good question. I would, like to th I, I would like it if they did. I would like it if they did. I think that our relationship with the European Union is much more effective when there is a balancing role that's being played. Un I don't think that there's much of a balancing role being played right now. I think that the Europeans are far too quick to go along with what the United States wants to do. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't go along with what we want to do. I'm saying that there are more instances in which the European Union is more worried about unity between America and Europe than they are about achieving outcomes. Sometimes it's helpful for the Europeans to push back against us. Let me give you an example. On Iran, President Bush and President Obama have bent over backwards to try to create unity between America and Europe on this issue. We feel like it is easier to hold Iran accountable if Iran is not able to exploit divisions between the two of us. The problem, of course, in all of this is when you get to the point where you actually have to negotiate and trade in leverage that we have built up. You've got to play some of your chips as the West in order to get the Iranians to play some of their chips and vice versa. And it's going to be very difficult for the United States to play its chips in the short to medium term. We're talking about sanctions that have passed in Congress. And if sanctions have passed in Congress, that means Congress needs to lift them. And the likelihood of Congress being proactive on lifting sanctions instead of trying to pass new ones is, well, it's, it's going to be very tough. There's going to be a lot of heavy lifting by the president to try and get that done. It's much easier for the European Union to lift sanctions. They don't have to go to Congress. They get all 27 member states sitting around a table, and with the stroke of the pen, they can do it. It requires political will, but it's easier to achieve. The problem, of course, in all of this is they're not going to do it until the United States says, OK, go for it, do it. Again, I emphasize that it's not to say that the European Union does whatever we tell them to do on every single issue. We've actually had pretty serious differences of opinion as it pertains to the Ukraine. I, I'm, not sure you heard a former, or excuse me, a current senior U.S. official had some unsavory words to say about uh, Europe's policy uh, on the Ukraine. Um, she, I believe she had her phone tapped by the Russians and got caught saying, um, F the EU. You know, uh, undiplomatic remark by a seasoned diplomat. Um, so disagreements exist. But at the end of the day, It's much easier, in my view, to achieve objectives together if you have 
I don't want to call it good cop, bad cop, um, because I think the whole good cop, bad cop thing has gone out the window now. I mean, now what we're talking about is, you know, bad cop and insane cop. And that's not productive. And the reason why it's not productive is because you have to give countries a way out. You can't just back them into a corner and expect them, and expect them to capitulate. So this is where the EU could be the good cop, right? And then there are instances where the EU could be the bad cop and we could be the good cop. It depends on the relationships that we have and they have with a given country. If it becomes cookie cutter, you actually become less effective. You have less flexibility. And if you have less flexibility, you have less options to solve problems around the world. This is why. You know, it would be great at the end of the day if we could tell everybody to jump and then they would say how high, but that's not usually how it works. Well, speaking of that, here's a question. Can you provide a recent example of when diplomacy has worked, it, for instance, in the Middle East? Sure. Interim nuclear deal with Iran. Interim nuclear deal with Iran. In May of 2013, that's less than a year ago, it would have been unthinkable to consider the possibility of the United States and Iran reaching a deal on the nuclear program. It would have been unthinkable not because it's not possible and not because people didn't have creative ideas on how to achieve it. People, in myself included, would have said the likelihood is low, if not impossible, because the leaders are not taking the risks that are necessary to find peaceful solutions. The political leaders are not doing what they need to do. New president comes into power in Iran. Less than a year later, we have an interim deal. And frankly, we got more out of the interim deal than the Iranians did. So it's a good deal. It's rolled back some of the most troubling aspects of their program. Yes, we had to give a little in order to get a little, but diplomacy worked. And not only did it work to get the interim deal, it created a six to 12 month window for us to negotiate free of the typical kinds of domestic pressures that we are you know, all too common now, not only in Washington, but also in Tehran, to continue the negotiating process, to do diplomacy the way that it's done all over the world. That's one area where it's proven successful. But since we're here to talk about the Arab Spring, let's, let's use another example of where diplomacy has proven to be successful, and, and we'll use an example in the Arab world. We could use an example in Syria of the, the deal to avoid war and remove chemical weapons. Certainly, that deal deserves its fair share of criticism because the process of getting the chemical weapons out is much slower than it should be otherwise. But the reason why I consider it to be successful, if you have a ledger of good versus bad in analyzing this particular deal, is because, again, we have to ask ourselves, what's our goal? Would a military conflict, would war, would occupation and invasion achieve our strategic objective? I think we very rightly reached the conclusion that it would not. So what we did is we worked with the Russians and some other countries to come up with a way to de-escalate that conflict. And make no mistake, it's good to get chemical weapons out of Syria, even though it's happening at a slower pace than it should. But the real goal, where, the real goal there was to de-escalate the conflict and move back from the precipice of war. Because war would not have solved the problem. Because war is already ongoing there. So you get foreign countries even more mixed in than they already are. And then it becomes a, 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 a somewhat similar case to Iraq, where you very publicly break it, and you very publicly own it. And that's not something that the Europeans or the United States wanted to do. The, I, and again, by cutting that interim deal, getting the weapons out, even though it's not going as quickly as it should, and stepping back from the precipice of war was predicated on creating a window to try and find a political solution to stop the killing in Syria. I'll be the first to admit that it's not going as well as everybody hoped that it would. But I also think there's a lot of blame to go around when we examine why it's not going as well as it should. The United States is making mistakes, Russia is making mistakes, the Iranians, the Saudis are making mistakes. There's a lot of blame that deserves to go around. And unfortunately, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. But we have to right-size our expectations when we're talking about diplomacy. Sometimes diplomacy is about, 
Sometimes it's about making a small amount of progress to create a window to make larger amounts of progress. But overall, it's always about building trust when trust does not uh, previously exist between two parties. It's about creating mechanisms that could be put in place to hold two sides accountable. And the reason why countries do that is because it becomes crystal clear in their minds what the alternative is, war, and that's a very unattractive alternative. Shifting gears a little bit, can you speak about the role of social media in the Arab Spring revolutions and what's the role of social media going forward? Sure. No, I think it's a tool and it's a valuable one. Um, it's another way to try and hold governments accountable. It's another way to get information out and inform the world. Um, but it is not something that can replace the very hard and real work that needs to be done by people in these countries when it comes to solving conflict, uh, finding common ground, rebuilding institutions, and overall building an, a better future. So it, it's a tool to help you get to where you're trying to go, and it's a tool that can help you build a better tomorrow. But there's nothing, whether it's social media or anything else, that can replace rolling up your sleeves and actually doing the dirty work. So I want to acknowledge the important role that it can play, but I want to make sure that everybody understands that you know, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, YouTube, and all these kinds of things, their efficacy is limited, right? Their efficacy is limited. So uh, I don't think a, such a thing exists as a Twitter revolution. I think a revolution happens, and things like Twitter, and YouTube, and Facebook can help get the word out and create momentum. Um, so. There are pros, and I don't want to say that there are cons, but uh, there can be cons or negatives if too much emphasis and an over-reliance is placed on it. Yeah? That's what I would say. All right, one, one last question. Oops, sorry, because of time. Uh, Egypt receives more U.S. foreign slash military aid than all countries other than Israel according to this person, should we continue to provide this military aid or try to leverage this with the Egyptian military? Oh, it's an important question. This goes back to the idea of interests versus values. It is in our interest to try and maintain a strong alliance with Egypt. It's, it's, it's a big and influential country in the Arab world. Uh, but are we maintaining that interest that we have with Egypt at the expense of our values? I think one could make an argument that to a certain degree, yeah, uh, that has been the case. Um, but that doesn't mean that we haven't sought to take steps to try and figure out how to pull off a very di inherently difficult balancing act. My personal view is that it's worth exploring the idea of trying to use the leverage that we have as a result of military aid and other things with countries like Egypt, not only Egypt, but since the question was about Egypt, we'll use them as an example to see if we can't leverage governments to treat their people better, to adopt policies that are more beneficial for everybody instead of a select few, uh, and to de-escalate conflict overall. I can't guarantee you that it'll be successful, though, because the Egyptian government could very well respond by turning to another country, say China or Russia or Saudi Arabia, and say, we'll get this money from somewhere else. They could do that. The question, though, is, is that sustainable in the long run? Is that really what they want to do? Here's where I make the argument that, no, that's not what they want to do. Uh, they want our weapons. They want our technology. Uh, they want our military advisors. And they want the relationship because when you're dealing with us, you're getting the best of the best. And they know that. If there was no difference in dealing with the United States, and the Chinas and the Russians in the world, then they would be doing more business with these countries already. But the fact of the matter is they're not. And that in and of itself can be leverage. But it's only leverage insofar as your willingness to test it as leverage. I think there's more we can do on that front. Is there a risk involved? Sure. Uh, but given what we've seen in this part of the world, not just in Egypt, but other countries as well, the kind of mass discontent that we've seen, and people demonstrating very clearly that their political, economic, and social aspirations are long been unmet, and they're seeking a better future, I think gives us reason now more than ever to test the proposition of using that leverage in a way that could potentially help build a better future. 
All right, thank you, Reza, for extremely captivating and insightful insight into Arab Spring. <clears throat> Our next session is Monday, March 24th, with Walter Bastian, an official with the U.S. Department of Commerce in Washington, D.C. He will take part in an armchair discussion on U.S. trade policy in the Western Hemisphere. Our meeting is adjourned, membership desk is open, and hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everybody.